Okay, we're continuing with our Accounting Background Foundation information. In this meeting, we'll talk about adjusting entries and um, also closing entries. And then usually I embed the exercises. So I have some small examples in this one, but the um, OpenStax examples that I'm gonna use, I'm gonna make a separate video for those because I'd like to do a little more intense review about adjustments and closing. So I'll do one video relating to adjustments and another one about closing. But um, that's for examples. But this is the overview discussion about both of them where I try to just like shake out some of the confusion. Okay, so starting out, we'll talk about a couple of uh, concepts and we already introduced the, a couple of these, but I wanna just make sure you understand it because they're the background of why we need to do adjusting entries. Uh, revenue recognition is basically helping us to get the income into the period where it belongs, where in other words, the, the proper period to report it is the period that that income was actually earned. And so regardless of whether you collected it now or not, uh, it's, or if you collected some in advance, that's not the pertinent part. It's not about the, when the cash moved. It's about when the goods or service moved. So uh, accrual basis accounting has this foundational concept called revenue recognition and another one related to it called expense recognition or matching. And those are the basis for accrual accounting. And so um, for revenue recognition, we're just trying to make sure the revenue lands in the right place. And that's why we have to sometimes accrue revenue in as if, such as whenever a customer, uh, we sell a product or we provide a service to a customer and they don't pay us right away. They don't give us cash when we provide that service or goods. Instead, they give us a promise to pay and that is an accounts receivable. So accounts receivable relating to revenue and accounts payable relating to the expense or are the accounts that we set up in order to orchestrate this accrual accounting related to the revenue and expense, because we want to report it as revenue when we earn it. So if they don't give us the cash, the way we do that is by accruing the income, recording the revenue, but showing it as accounts receivable. And then the way we would show an expense in the correct period, we want that expense to show up in the period that it helped create the income. So the way that we get that income that expense into the right income period is that we accrue the expense, even if it wasn't paid yet. And so that's why we have accounts payable when we buy something from our vendors. If we need it in this period, but we haven't paid for it yet, we just accrue it. And that is um, that is the basis for um, accrual accounting. And that's what um, expense recognition or matching is about. Sometimes you, instead of that, sometimes you have to prepay an expense, but you don't want to put it in your expense yet because it's not actually helping you produce income yet. So that's when you do a, what's called a deferral. And that would be when you record purchases as prepaid insurance, for example. You don't want to show it as an interest expense until it actually benefits the business. So you put it into an asset account called prepaid insurance until it actually benefits you. The same thing with the revenue, you could do a deferral of the revenue if you collect cash early from a customer and you don't, you know it's not time to recognize it yet because you haven't provided the service or goods to the customer yet, then you would put it in a, a deferred revenue account, probably called unearned revenue. Okay, so these are the basis of why we have to make adjustments at the end of the period. Okay, the, if we were using the cash basis of accounting, it would just be based on what was collected, cash that was collected and cash that was paid. Well, that that is a method that some people use, especially for their tax work. Uh, a little, a lot of small companies use the cash basis to report their income if they aren't required to report uh, to the SEC or if they aren't required to provide accrual basis accounting records for their bank or some other. Uh, governmental agency or regulatory uh, agency. And so these um, cash basis is still in effect in the world today. But for our purposes, we will be studying accrual basis because by and large, that's the kind of thing that CPAs have to deal with. See, um, as a rule in big corporations, really almost any corporation, but not all, um, accrual basis accounting is what is being used, especially if it's a publicly traded company. And that's um, 
because they're required under the generally accepted accounting principles rule under the gap rules uh, to go ahead and show it as accrual, not cash. So when you do accrual basis accounting, you want to recognize the revenue was earned and recognize expenses when they help produce the revenue. So here's some examples of what might happen if you had, this is just my little thing I made up. Actually, I like to use an example about king cake since I'm in Louisiana. Um, king cake is a pretty big part of our life here in Louisiana. So I always like to pretend that I'm selling king cakes when I do these examples about accrual and deferrals, just so I can try to make it real. Okay, so for example, if you have, um, if you are talking about the revenue side of things, and let's say that I brought to class some king cakes that I wanted to sell. Now, they won't let me sell things to class, but if they would, then maybe I brought two king cakes to class and I had, I set them in the front of the class and I started pitching them, you know, all these king cakes are the best ones you ever tasted. They're so wonderful, freshly made, you know, and I saw I'm talking about talking it up and I'm trying to get somebody to take me up on buying this king cake, right? And so um, I keep talking about it until finally a student raised their hand and said, oh, I would like to buy a king cake. Please let me buy a king cake. And so I'm like, okay, well, they're $25. So um, if you got the cash, just come on up and get the cake. And so this student comes up with the $25. They pull out of their pocket. They hand me $25. I hand them a king cake. Everybody's happy. That is a cash transaction. That's recorded whether you're on the cruel basis or the or the cash basis is still recorded just the same with a debit to cash and a credit to revenue. So that would be selling a king cake outright for cash. Okay, that I just earned it now. I mean, I delivered the cake. I made the cake and it was ready to sell, but it's sort of like it was in my inventory at that point, but it wasn't sold yet. But as soon as I did the deal and I handed the cake to the student, then it was sold. It, I completed the deal by handing it to them, delivery. And so I earned it now and I collected the cash now. So clearly I'm going to recognize the revenue. And so that one is good. So that's one king cake. Now I still got this other king cake I'm trying to sell. So I'm like, okay, well, I got one more if anybody's interested. I mean, no pressure. And um, so, you know, somebody else raised their hand very shyly and says, um, Dr. Weber, I would love to have that king cake. I'm so excited about it, but I didn't bring my cash. And so if you would let me have that king cake, I would bring you the money Monday morning as soon as I come back to class. And I, I'm like, hmm. Okay, well, let's just assume that I know this person. I mean, I feel comfortable with the student and I'm or like, as in your customer, you trust them. So you extend credit and you say, okay, fine. You take the gag and I'll get the money Monday when you come back. So now what we've done is we've got a difference between the cash basis and the accrual basis. Because if it was a cash basis and I didn't get the money yet, then I wouldn't report it as, as revenue. But on a accrual basis, which is what we're trying to learn about, if I had this cake to the student, then I just made a sale. I made the whole delivery. So I have to accrue the revenue in. So what happened is, it's, I'm saying, okay, you bring me the $25 Monday. Here, you have the cake. As soon as I hand them the cake, I made a sale. And so this is an accrued revenue transaction. And what happened is I earned the money now, but I'm going to collect on it later. So in order to record that, I would debit accounts receivable, I would credit the revenue account for the $25. That's called accrued revenue. That's gonna that's um, gonna show up as an asset on my on my balance sheet, accounts receivable, right? We've been doing some of these, but this is trying to just trying to make it a little more understandable about what might happen. Okay, so I had those two cakes. I sold both king cakes. So now I'm like ready to go on with the day and teach my lecture, right? Except for now, I got the student with their hand up in the back and said, Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Weber, I have $25 and I wanted that king cake really bad, but you just sold it to them and they didn't even have the money. And so I'm like, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I don't have another one today, but you know, I could just make you another cake. And so the student's like, Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just give you the money now while I know I have it. I put it in my pocket, I'm going to hand you the $25. And I'm like, oh, you don't have to do that. I'm not wearing the cake to Monday. But, oh, yeah, but I might spend it before Monday. Here, you take the $25, Dr. Weber, and I will just wait till Monday to get the cake. So do you think I have a sale? Did I give them a cake? No. No sale until I give them a cake. But here I am holding this $25.
I have to record the $25 sale for the king cake, but I can't show it as revenue. So this is called a deferral on the revenue side. So what I've done is I earned, I'm going to earn the, the revenue from the cake later, but I collect it in advance. I collected it right now, the $25 in my hand. I have to do something with it. So I'm going to record this $25 as a debit to cash because I mean, I got to put it in the bank. So I'm debiting cash, $25. I'm crediting an account called unearned revenue. Could be unearned fees, unearned revenue. And a lot of times it's unearned rent if you get cash in advance for a rent payment. But in this case, for a king cake, it's going to be unearned revenue. So uh, I put $25 as a credit to unearned revenue. So what I've got is a deferred revenue and it's a liability because I owe them this king cake. If I don't come up with a king cake on Monday, I'm going to have to give them their money back because I owe them. That's a liability, my company, my little mini company called the King Cake, King Cake Sales. Um, I owe them the cake. So that's why it's a liability. It's a credit account uh, because it's a liability and it's called unearned revenue. It's the rare exception. If you see an account with the word revenue, generally it's going to be actually a revenue account. But this one, if it says unearned with it, or if it says deferred with it, then it's actually a liability revenue account. Because it's what it is, is holding on the balance sheet as a liability until such time that it's proper to record it as revenue. Okay, so that's cool. So then we got, we know what to do with revenue at three different ways. If we earn it now and collect it now, if we earn it now and collect it later, which is an accrual, or if we earn it later and collect it now, which is a deferral. Okay, now let's look at the expense side. Still thinking about our king cakes. Okay, there's three scenarios that might happen on the cost regarding my king cake. I need the expenses of everything that I do in my business to land in the period where the revenue is um, earned. So I've got these, I'm looking at the expenses. I'm like, okay, well, I had expenses. Let's say I went to the store. I'm gonna go to the grocery store. I pick up some flour and sugar and cinnamon. Um, and I, and maybe some sprinkles, you know, a lot of little things I need to make king cakes. And I have all these things and I just pick them up for cash. I go to the store, I pay cash for it. So that part of the cost, it say that's like $5 worth of my cost of my king cake then I, that's something I'm using the cost to make a cake today and I'm paying for it today. I just went to the store this morning, got the stuff. I made it before I came to class. And so I got, I'm going to debit the expense, credit cash. doesn't matter if I'm cash basis or accrual basis. I'd still record the same way because it's just a cash transaction. Okay. So that's, you, if you use some, if something now to produce income and you pay for it now, you just show it as an expense with the credit cash. So that's clean and easy, right? But there's two other scenarios that could happen. I could use a use something up now and pay for it later. For instance, whenever you make king cakes, you could just make king cakes with just basic things you have at your home. Most of the time, especially if you're from Louisiana, you have all the ingredients for king cakes all the time. But well, mostly. But what if um, you what if you had some expenses that um, what if, if even though you could buy a king cake, if you're going to sell it, you might need some other expenses. So like I might need some disposable trays or some boxes that are uh, paper boxes. So there might be something that I have to last minute think, oh, I couldn't find that at the grocery store. OK, well, let me just call my local paper warehouse distributor, which is just in our in the area where we live, there's this um, paper company that just has their own truck and they local deliver things like plastic goods and napkins and paper boxes and things like that. So I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta have some something to put these in before I take them to class. So I need some paper boxes. So I call up this company that I have an account with because they supply my office with um, you know, like napkins and um, paper uh, products, plastic forks and knives and so just general um you know kitchen supplies that the office needs okay or coffee or whatever and so um I call them up and I say look I'm sorry I know this is a, a long shot but I'm making some king cakes for sale and I was wondering you have some boxes you could put a king cake in they're just like not too expensive but they would fit the king cakes. all right great they say yes they do I'm like, great Okay, well, this is Janice Weber. And so would you just drop them by when you're on your route by here? 
And they're like, oh, sure, we'll just put it on your account. And so they drive by my office. They just drop off some boxes, a couple of boxes I'm going to use in my cakes that I'm taking to class today. And so they drop off the boxes. I use the boxes today for the cakes I brought to class. So I have an expense clearly, but I didn't give them the money because they said they were going to like bill me. So I need to record this as an expense. I'm going to debit expense. I'm going to credit accounts payable, which is an accrued expense account. It's a liability. And all it is, is I would show it as cash when I buy, when I pay an expense. But if I haven't paid for it yet, I have to record it into an account that says, you still owe this. It's a liability, accounts payable. So that's that. So let's say we had another, um, I can't remember how much I said I had in the first, I had $5 worth of expense the first time. Let's say this is another two bucks. So I got $7 in this so far. Okay, so then I'm rocking along, everything's great, except for what about if I bought some things at the store that were kind of pricey and I thought, if I'm going to keep doing this, I need to get a better price. So I get to think about it. I'm like, you know what the most expensive thing was that I feel like I've cut into my profits with is those beads I put on the king cake. They were very expensive. So I'm going to buy a bunch of beads. I'm going to get a big bulk pack so I can make a lot of king cakes. So what I do is call down to South Louisiana to this Mardi Gras supply store and they have bulk pack beads and they're gorgeous really pretty and I can throw I can get my king cake that's so delicious and then I can throw some pretty beads on it and it'll make it much more marketable I'll probably get those students to buy them really fast then so anyway you know I'm, I'm kind of crazy but anyway so I called in there I get them on the phone and you got some Mardi Gras beads that are really cheap but still gorgeous and they're like oh yes we definitely do and I'm like okay great just ship me some here's my address can you just send me a box and they say, sure, it'd be $300. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of money. Is there a lot of beads in there? Yes. Okay, so, all right, great. Send them to me, $300, it's gonna work out. So they're, um, so I'm about to hang up the phone and they're like, um, excuse me, Ms. Weber. I'm like, yes? I'm like, how did you wanna pay for that? Because see, they don't know Dennis Weber. They don't bill, they don't just bill me next month. They want their money now. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well then, um, I'll, I'll just give you a card, and then I'll I'll let you I'll let you pay draft my account with that. And so, okay, so I give them my debit card information so that they can draft my bank account. So effectively, I'm paying the three hundred dollars right now today, right? So what I've got is I didn't actually use these beads in my cake today. I'm just buying them to put on the next cake. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the beads later. But I'm paying for them now in advance. So this is a deferred expense, also known as a prepaid expense. So what we're going to do is we're going to debit an account called prepaid supplies or supplies or maybe bead inventory. But whatever you want to name it is a deferred asset that is a prepaid expense. So I'm put I debit the prepaid account for $300 and I credit cash for $300 because I just gave them the money. So this is a deferred expense. So I've got my king cake sale, the revenue side of it, I can see the three scenarios that might happen. And then I see the expense side of it, the three scenarios that might happen. So any of these might happen in a cruel basis. And the reason we have to be so meticulous about deciding whether it's accrued or deferred is because we're trying to get the revenue in the right period and we're trying to get the expense in the period that it helped produce that revenue. So that's why these gyrations with adjustments are needed. That's a very long example, but pancakes are a lot of fun. Okay, so the bottom line for adjusting entries. Accruals are the transactions, whether cash is not collected or paid yet, but the income or expense is related to the period being reported. So accruals always involve either a payable or a receivable, not both at the same time. So that's accruals. Then deferrals, transactions where the cash is collected or paid, but the income or the expense is not related to this period being reported. So those two adjustments are very, very common, accruals and deferrals. Another adjustment that happens is an estimate. So the main estimate we're gonna talk about in this um, lecture is the depreciation, but there's also gonna be adjustments we'll be picking up in the future where no cash is moving, but an adjustment needs to be made for things like bad debts. And um, mostly it's bad debt and depreciation that you'll see. But depreciation is one we're introduced early because it shows up in a lot of exercises you have. 
So I'm not trying to teach you all about depreciation right now. We have a whole chapter in that later. All I want is to introduce depreciation uh, just briefly. So you kind of have an idea of what in the world it is. So basically you buy this long-term asset that's going to benefit your company for a very long period of time. And you spread the cost of that over the period you think it'll benefit. And that is just the way depreciation works. So you take the cost of it, you estimate its life, and you spread that depreciation a little bit at a time. When you do, you make an entry that debits depreciation expense and credits accumulated depreciation, which is a contra asset account. So then on the, on the uh, balance sheet, after you make this entry, you'd have your asset value. And then right below it, you would have less accumulated depreciation. So every period that you make this adjustment for depreciation expense, with a debit and credit to accumulate it, you're making a larger and larger account of balance for accumulated depreciation. So if I depreciated something uh, that cost um, $2,000 over a 10 year period, then I would be depreciating $200 a month. So every year, another $200 would get added to uh, accumulated depreciation. And that, that uh, accumulated depreciation is reducing the book value of the asset because the book value, or also known as net book value, is just the asset's original cost minus the accumulated appreciation at that point in time. Every time you have an adjusting entry, it's going to affect one income statement account and one balance sheet account. Because what adjusting is, is just a toggle between the balance sheet and the income statement. You look at your balance sheet and you say, now does this look right and good? And if these numbers clean and this is what these values really should be, or, sh or some of these things that I had listed as a deferral or an accrual, some of these maybe should be shifted over and over to the balance sheet to recognize the revenue or the expense at this during this period. Okay, now you got this accounting cycle. We need to talk about this. The accounting cycle starts out with any event that, that happens. You make a journal entry to record what happened. So the first thing you do is think about what just happened. So you can make sure that you're recording it properly. So you think about the event that happened. That's those descriptions they have for the journal entries usually. And then you record it with a journal entry, a debit to one account, a credit to another, sometimes a compound entry that has more than two entries, but at least one, of, one debit and one credit. And then you post that journal entry to the general ledger, which is the T accounts that we've been talking about. And then from that general ledger, you pull a trial balance that gives you a total of the debits and credits, each account and what its debit or credit balance is. And then once you have that trial balance, you make adjusting entries to true up the balances that are there, make sure they're correct because you're trying to clean it up so you'll be ready to make good financial statements that are accurate. So once you've adjusted the entries, you post those adjustments to the T accounts or the general ledger. And then you pull another trial balance with the adjusted balances. And so once you have that adjusted trial balance, that is your source for making the financial statements. So you start with the income statement, just like always, then go to the retained earnings statement, then flow that into the balance sheet. And then you would pick up the cash flow statement after that. So once you finish doing your financial statements, then you have one more step to make and that is the closing entry. So that's what we're learning today. We've already in previous chapters talked about these steps, as you know, but we now are picking up these adjustments that need to be made in order to make the financial statements accurate. And then we're going to, after that, learn how to close out the book and get ready for the next period. Okay, so um, we're going to, this chapter covers adjusting and closing, which um means that we have to transition at this point. I'm going to do a lot of exercises on another video, but for now, I'm just going to talk overview about the closing. Closing has two types of accounts. When you look at your trial balance, the adjusted trial balance after you've done your financial statements, then you have two types of account on there. Some are permanent, meaning those balances need to carry forward for a new period. And some are temporary, meaning those balances need to wipe out so you can start tracking again what those um, what that activity is for the new period. So the temporary accounts are the ones that show up in the income statement plus dividends. So temporary accounts, also known as nominal accounts, include revenue, expenses, and dividends. 
It's like there's just containers that you're tracking your cost in for each period. And then at the end of the period, you're going to dump whatever balance in those containers is into the big vat that is retained earnings. So all these um, revenue expense and dividends are holding the cost or the revenue for that period of time. So you'll know what, how much did we make this period? How much did it cost just to make that kind of revenue? And then how much would, did we pay out to the shareholders? That's the dividends. And so you're tracking so you'll be able to keep up with what happened this period. But then when the period's over, you're like, well, that's history now. Let's move that over to retained earnings so we can start fresh with this new period of tracking the revenue, the expenses, and the dividends for this period. The purpose of the closing entries is to clean out those accounts that I'm talking about, dumping those temporary containers. That's closing entries. So there are two ways to do closing, and I'm going to show you both of them just because I've taught accounting in the, at the intro level in multiple textbooks and half of them, well, I won't say half because I haven't done all books, but the ones I've dealt with, about half of them did it through a four-step method and then others did it directly to retained earnings. And so I'm going to show you both just so you'll be familiar so it won't throw you if you see this in another book later on or if you get a refresher course in accounting, you see it, you're like, what, they change how they do this? No, there's actually just two ways. Uh, so, okay, let's see what we can do. Oh, keeping in mind, closing entries are trying to empty out an account. So when you close something, you're going to do the opposite of its normal balance because you're trying to bring that account to zero to get it reset for the new period. So here we go. When we close revenue, we take whatever the balances are in the revenue accounts and we debit those accounts. You know that revenue are credit balance accounts. To close them, you have to debit them. And you're going to close them like using the four-step method. You close them into this closing account called income summary. And so um, it's a super temporary account. And it only is open one day. So you close out all the revenue into income summary with one entry that debits all the revenue accounts separately, each revenue account separately, and credits the whole total to income summary. And then you take the expenses, which we know all have a debit balance, but we're trying to zero them out. So we're gonna take every individual expense item and credit the balance to them. We're gonna debit the total of that to this super temporary account, closing account, income summary. So right now we've got a debit to income summary, just then of 59.4, but we had already put a credit to income summary of 86.6. So what we do now is we look at it and say, okay, what's the balance of income summary? Well, income summary started out, let's see, I wish I had a T account here. Let's see if I got a T account. No, no T account. Okay, I'll make it sort of like a T account. Let's say we're gonna have it. income summary, just the heading. And then we're gonna we're on the debit side. We post this fifty nine four. On the credit side, we post this eighty six six. I'm just trying to make a T account. We'll see how close I get to it. That's not too good, is it? Let me go back and try something different. Okay. Okay, well, just pretend it has a line between it since I didn't do a very good job of getting. So if this was your income summary, a T account, you had a credit of 86.6 and a debit of 59.4. So that means your ending balance for income summary after these two entries is 27.2, right? Because your credit balance of 86.6 is the bigger one. So you know your income summary is gonna have a credit balance ending 86.6 and then the debit ate up part of that 86.6, the debit of 59.4 reduced the 86.6 down to 27.2. So 27,200 is the ending balance in the income summary. So now we're gonna close the super temporary account we're going to close income summary. In order to do that, if we have a, a balance of 27.2, that's a credit. That means we need a debit to close it. 
So to close income summary, we need to debit it. Because every time when we close something, we're just trying to wipe out the account, make it zero. So we're dumping this 27.2 out of income summary into retained earnings. I've changed my numbering system by doing that. You see that? Let me go ahead and loot. I'll just go ahead and take this down a little bit so it can move to the next page. We close the revenue, step one. We close the expenses, step two. Now we're going to close income summary by debiting whatever balance it has. Well, I'm sorry, by reversing whatever balance it has, it had a credit balance, so I'm going to debit it. It does sometimes happen that it's the other way around because sometimes there's a loss in the company. But whatever happens, if income summary, when you post what actually happened with revenue and expense to your income summary account, whatever its balance is, you reverse it to close it. So that's what we're doing. We close income summary to retained earnings. We don't ever close retained earnings. We close the temporary accounts into retained earnings. So the first step was close revenue, then close expense, then close income summary. And then the fourth step is to close dividends. Dividends is a debit balance account. We always know that because the debit balance, normal balances are assets, dividends and expenses, right? So since dividends has a debit balance, in order to close it, we have to credit it. So we, cl we close credit, we close dividends by crediting it and debiting retained earnings. So we're dumping all the things into retained earnings. The alternative method would be go straight to retained earnings. You see what these people, uh, you see what this entry, the same exact scenario, I use the same numbers and everything, uh, would be you could look at all, um, do the two-step method, you could close all revenue expense in one entry by reversing their balance. Every revenue account that has a credit balance, of course, you would close it with a debit. And every expense account that we know has a debit balance, we're going to reverse it by crediting that account. So when you put those two together, you'd have an entry. And usually I like to put the retained earnings in the middle, just in case. But usually, if you have a profit situation, retained earnings is always going to be a credit when you close, but it's just you don't always have a profit. So if you have a net income that's in the negative, more expenses than you have revenue, then retained earnings would actually be a debit. So what you do is you look at everything else first. Look at all the debits and credits of your journal entry. And then you, to make it balance, you, you debit or credit retained earnings. And it's almost always a credit that you make to retained earnings, but just not absolutely every time. So first, you're, you're with the two-step method of closing, you're closing all revenue expenses in one fail swoop and ignoring totally the income summary account. Then you close dividends. So the effect of this is the two-step method is exactly the same result as if the four-step method. It's just for me, I like the four-step better because it's a little bit cleaner what we're doing. We close all the revenue. Step one, step two, close all the expenses. Step three, close income summary. And step four, close dividends. But this two-step method still works just fine. And so I just want to make sure you understand there's just two options. Now, I'm going to end the, this lecture at this point, but I do have a lot of adjustment and closing demo exercises that I'm going to post as a separate video video and you really need to watch those because they honestly the more reps you get on this the more you're going to understand so I'm going to post a video of each of these using the OpenStax exercises and again I, in my lecture notes I have the link it's right here um, openstax.org and it's the principles of accounting volume one this this lecture these these exercises for this chapter I'm pulling from chapter four and five of the OpenStax book okay thanks